Hi, Mark. How's it going, Hamish? How would you say that kind of new students coming into recording academies have changed over the last few decades in terms of what they know, what they don't know, and some shortcomings and that sort of thing? Yes, we've had the Blackbird Academy in Nashville for six years, but this is my 34th year of teaching. So I have seen some changes. I think, well, for one thing, when I started teaching, I'd been recording for all of five years myself. So I was, I think, more in the same boat as they were. But I think that the process of learning about audio has changed in interesting ways since then, which is in the earlier times, people learned the way that I learned, which was we started with a limited number of tools, tried to get the most we could out of them. And you were able to build the education in a more systematic, logical way from the basics out. Uh, what I see now is that you know anybody that has Pro Tools has more signal processing power than almost any recording studio of the 60s, 70s, or 80s. They have more options than you had with a, any SSL. Right? You know, every, everything is automatable. You can do everything that you, you can do a thousand times more than you can do with any tape machine. So in some interesting ways, educating people who come in that have been working on Pro Tools or Logic or even Fruity Loops or what have you, is that it's almost a deconstruction process. It's kind of more about carving down all the infinite number of possibilities and focusing them more on the kind of discipline that it takes, the mental discipline that it takes to, uh, to make cogent decisions, uh, as opposed to just randomly putting plugins on things because you saw somebody do it online or on YouTube or because you read that that's how it's done. It's interesting uh, to try to break it down for them and take it from the very bones of it out and build a, a coherent understanding of, of the process. Have you noticed any differences in terms of the tastes of recording students over the years and kind of what mics they like and that sort of thing? Well, certainly, uh, I mean, musical tastes are different. In terms of what microphones, it's probably the same, which is what they can afford. <laughs> and uh, it's also sort of funny that so much of what, we're, of what we use these days is the same stuff we used when I got into this in the 70s. You know, we're still using 57s, 58s, and SM7s, and we still find at Blackbird, where we have all the microphones in the world, that frequently an SM7 will beat out a U47. <laughs> and you're holding one now, I see. Are there things that you learn from students, too, when you're doing teaching? Every day. Every day. You know, I, I learn uh, from their musical taste and their approach. And so many of them know uh, either about genres of music that I'm not as familiar with or just have a different approach or different philosophy. You know, we get people from all over the world. So um, I learn from them. And, of course, I learn by teaching. There's no better way to learn something than by having to teach it. To be able to put it into words and explain it is different from being able to do it. Uh, there are a lot of good engineers. They don't all make good teachers just because they can't necessarily put it into words. And for them, I think there's a little bit of the goose that laid the golden egg where it interferes too much with their process if they have to verbalize it. But yes, I do. I, I learn from the students all the time. I'm so lucky to have them. And one of the differences, getting to your earlier question, just in terms of uh, their preferences for equipment, is that they have so much more available to them that's more affordable. And I view that as wonderful. You know, that they, for not that much money, they can have a, a reasonable tool chest of microphones and processors and so on. And I think that that's one of the wonderful things about modern recording. I think, to me, there are a few golden, golden ages of recording. Um, you know, probably the earliest times of recording, the 50s and early 60s, when you had to record everything mono and engineer it in real time. I guess I'm including all the history of it now, I think, but the, the 60s and 70s as, as multi-tracks and synthesizers and that kind of proliferation came in. And now, I think this is a wonderful golden age of recording, and a lot of it has to do with accessibility to the tools. And one of the things that I think is great about that 
which is the typical double-edged sword of technology, is that we can no longer claim that we are hobbled by a lack of access. You know, it's hard to say, well, I, I can't, you know, yes, I could mix as well as Andrew Sheps, if only I had some EVE consoles and a wall of outboard gear and so forth. Uh, but these days, Andrew Sheps is using the same tools that everyone else is using. And so the exciting thing is that we're only really differentiated by our talent, which, of course, is the depressing part. I just said, uh, the reason that Andrew Sheps is an incredible mixer is that he's an incredible human being with great ears and great mind and great skills. Um, and so some of the marketing that's been directed at everyone, the students and the engineers, that somehow if you get somebody's tools that have their name on them, that you're going to be the, that, that you're going to suddenly magically acquire their skills or their abilities, which is not the case if anyone's watched The Sorcerer's Apprentice in Fantasia. You know, Mickey Mouse puts on the wizard's robes. It goes badly wrong. Uh, but the good news is that though we'll never be Andrew Sheps, we will always be ourselves. And we have the capability to express that to its full potential. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have excuses for not doing so. When you're teaching recording techniques about different microphones and things, do you do it via kind of era, or do you just do it by the sound that it gets in the room now? It's a variety of approaches. Uh, one of the things that we're able to do since our classroom is a recording studio is I can put a lot of microphones up in a room outside of the students and route it to their individual Pro Tools systems so that they can compare microphones without confirmation bias without knowing that one is a U47 and therefore supposedly greater than a, a Navy microphone that I use that's $14. So uh, we do these shootouts between microphones and it's interesting for them to have to compare sounds, first of all, to use their ears and not use the kind of prejudgments that we get uh, from our visual system taking over or from the marketing system having taken over. So uh, we don't really approach it by genres and, or, or by eras. It's really just more by individual cases. And of course, a big part of teaching is to try to tell them that there is no system and there really aren't that many absolutes. And by there is no system, I mean there are no preset recipes that are going to work for everything. Uh, so I have to, even though we'll put up eight microphones and somebody will sing in all of them, and one will clearly be better on that person on that day through that gear based on what they're seeing. I think it's important to explain to them that that doesn't mean that's the best microphone for vocals. And so when we, when we repeat it enough, we start to realize that it's all context dependent and that even uh, people who've been recording for a long time don't, ne don't necessarily work just from some recipe. It's easy to fall into a, a rut or a habit, but uh, the important part is to keep an open mind, open ears, and to keep experimenting. So in, in many ways, rather than teaching them which microphone is best for an application, the most important thing I can teach them is that it's all variable and they, the, the constant is them and their developing aesthetic. Do you mostly teach kind of these techniques as if they were working at Blackbird or do you kind of do a mixture of that with stuff that they might have in their own kind of setups? It's more generalized. Uh, you know, we do have graduates who work at Blackbird, but we encourage them to go out into the world and start their own businesses or work for other people. And uh, so I think we would not be doing our job if we just chopped them in, in one system. The, uh, the class, which is a six-month program, is split by usually two-week intervals where they're in the classroom with me for two weeks learning things, and then they go into the studio and apply it for two weeks with other teachers who teach them other ways of doing things, Jeremy Cottrell and Kevin Betker, who are uh, excellent experienced engineers. So, but it w we would be failing them if it were just a job and how to use, uh, if it were a course and how to use one studio. Uh, and that's partly my job is to give them enough generalized theory and enough uh, non-specific direction that they can apply it to whatever they might end up doing. And they go everywhere. They might be doing video games or doing live sound or working in a big studio or having their own studio or editing samples or making EDM or being an artist and all the other things that they do. Uh, and uh, we really want to give them the tools to develop themselves as much as they can. 
Are there any things that students coming in kind of very often don't think of as important that are very important to the business or recording in general? It's hard to say. It's hard to know what their expectations are. They're so diverse that I'm sure their expectations are diverse. I think they, uh, even though we tell them they don't realize how fast six months goes by and how much information gets packed into that six months, I think hopefully they don't, but they may undervalue one of the most important parts of, of the whole experience, which is the bonds that they form with their classmates. Even though, again, we, we tell them that, I think, uh, you know, that's one of the most important things that they get from going to school is the, the, uh, the esprit de corps uh, from, from going through the process and the, the connections and how that works. And I've seen it uh, many times in, in our graduates that they band together and form businesses and studios and help each other and refer things to each other and form teams. So that might be a part that they might not value as much as they would realize. Could you talk about some of the people who taught you and influenced you when you were starting out recording? Absolutely. The guitar player in my band that I've been in for 39 years is a guy named Tim Veer, V-E-A-R. And he is the senior applications engineer for Sure Microphones. And he's been a great mentor to me and also to uh, other people, notably my very good friend Jonathan Pines, who works for Rupert Neve and SE Microphones. Tim was really, a, he is a walking library of information about audio. He uh, is an aerospace engineer turned audio engineer. And, uh, you know, partly just through all the gigs that we went and played in Illinois, driving through cornfields for endless hours and back in order to keep each other awake while driving to and from these shows, I would uh, pepper him with questions about audio. And that was very uh very helpful to me. So I, I think much of what I've learned, I got directly from Tim. Uh, coincidentally, the keyboard player in our band is an attorney, Roger Prillman. And I've learned a lot about law and intellectual property and so forth by peppering him with questions, partly under the guise of keeping each other awake while we're driving in those hours. But um, they've been very important people to me. Um, and Beyond that, you know, I learned from a guy named Scott Wyatt, who was a professor at the University of Illinois, where I went. He's an electronic music composer, and he let us hang around the studio when we were 12 years old, starting then, just cleaning up the studio and cleaning the heads on tape machines and that sort of thing. I learned a lot uh, about recording and technology, but especially about aesthetics uh, from him and from debating him. There was an interesting community of electronic music composers at the U of I. It was a kind of a center for that in the 60s and 70s and 80s particular. So I learned a lot by getting to be there and a lot about non-traditional approaches to recording. Um, and then, you know, I've learned from an awful lot of people that I've gotten to work with. I was friends with Les Paul. It was amazing to get to learn from him, but that, although that was later in his and my life. It's also been an interesting process, which is that Beyond those people, a lot of what I learned was from being isolated in a medium-sized town in the Midwest, where I was probably the person in the room that knew the most about audio and had to experiment and drive things. And before, really, there were many books on the subject. And when there were only a couple of recording magazines, I would uh, come up with things that I thought I had invented, which, of course, it turned out Joe Meek had been doing you know, 20 years before that. But, uh, you know, you know, all the amazing things you could do, like playing tape backwards, incredible, or reamping things and, uh, you know, deliberately distorting things and putting things in resonators. Um, it's a little bit of a different learning process when you feel as though you discovered it and it's your own as opposed to uh, getting it from somebody else. Could you talk a bit about the book that you're writing at the moment? I'm writing a book called The Great American Recording Studios for a company called Hal Leonard. It's a follow-up to a book that Howard Massey wrote called The Great British Recording Studios. And it's a history of American recording studios in the 1960s and 70s. Of, and, you know, a golden time in recording. In uh, the British book, they covered something like 50 recording studios. I'm struggling to hold it below 150, 
there were just so many amazing studios at the time, so many amazing stories, so much technology, so many wonderful people. So it's a, an interesting challenge of a project because if it's almost more of an editing project than it is a creation project. The, a big part of it is just trying to keep it manageable to realize that I'm not writing an encyclopedia, uh, but I'm uh, trying to trying to express in the most accurate way what that culture was like and how different it was from now. You know, now we have a proliferation. Everybody has a recording studio in their phone or their iPad. Uh, but they were really uh, very special places and kind of a hidden culture that influenced the culture at large. And uh, just interesting little laboratories of sound and technology and art that were um, mostly isolated from each other. There was a certain amount of secretiveness and competition. And it was still at a time where the culture in America was regionalized. You know, it was a different, you know, it was a different world in Detroit than it was in New Orleans. And it was a different world in New York than it was in Los Angeles. And Nashville was its own thing in Pacific Northwest. All those were um, places that were, had their own cultures and you could spot the music within a minute. You could hear it and, and know, you know, this is New Orleans music. Now you hear, you know, something that's bluegrass music. It could come from Korea or Finland. Um, so I'm trying to convey all of that and the kind of amazing people and the eccentrics and inventors and pioneers that were involved in, in making those incredible records. Can you pinpoint any broad differences between kind of different geographical locations, different studios in terms of East Coast, West Coast, and the South and the Midwest? There, well, of course, you know, the East Coast is a huge place and there were all sorts of things going on on the West Coast. Um, you know, part of what you had in, in New York, which I guess is mainly what you talk about when we talk about East Coast recording, uh, was the quality of the musicianship that you had people that were playing in pit orchestras and movie soundtracks and jingles and commercials and so forth. So there's a very high level of musicianship, a very high level of engineering that went with it, partly because, you know, in the period I'm writing about, 60s and 70s, at the beginning, uh, the big records were being made in uh, record company studios that were regimented and had union engineers. And uh, at a time where, you know, the engineers that were recording the records may have been the same engineers that designed the console and built it. They were uh, more likely to be electrical engineers, not engineers in the sense that we have now, which is more like a railroad engineer, right? Somebody who operates equipment but doesn't necessarily know it from the inside out. So especially in those early days in New York, there was a high level of competition, high level of excellence, and although this changed, big rooms, big old churches and movie theaters and repurposed rooms that were made for radio theater. And so there was a particular spaciousness to the sound that disappeared when those rooms disappeared, not as a result really changes in the recording industry so much as the real estate industry. You know, those studios that were knocked down to make parking lots. That's the end of the, most of these stories that I'm writing about is, and now it's a condo or, and now it's a parking lot. Um, then there was a shift to the West Coast, especially in the mid 60s for many reasons. And it, in, in a similar way, you know, you had these people that, that were working on Nack and Cole records or Frank Sinatra records or Hawaii Five O soundtracks that were also making other people's records. And the record crew was a huge influence on the music and recording industry uh, because they were the monkeys and they were the birds on the first record and they were the mamas and the papas and they were the beach boys and, and so on. So to a certain extent, that, that was similar, but there was different equipment. Uh, there were different influences and, and you know, just a different, a different vibe. Um, and then, you know, you had pockets of places that were kind of their own thing. Detroit, you know, where uh, famously Barry Gordy in, at Motown was influenced by the assembly line methods of creating cars in Detroit and tried to apply that to music to a certain extent. We had teams competing against each other. Uh, you had a sort of a talent machine that was picking up talent and purposing it and shaping it and so on. Of course, that changed through this period as well. New Orleans sounds like New Orleans. You know, it's, uh, it's a little bit slower and funkier and groovier. Uh, it has to do with, I have a couple of unconventional theories about the things that shaped recording. 
and one of them in, in respect to New Orleans is, I think one of the things that changed the sound and feel of music and recordings was air conditioning. I think a lot of stuff, the way it feels, the way it sounds in the South, you can hear that it was really hot in the studio. They either didn't have um, air conditioners or uh, they had to turn them off when, when they were recording. And so it was, it was just plain hot and you get that feeling, you get the, the sound. It's, it's, you know, it's the lifestyle. I mean, it, it's, I'm, I may be romanticizing a little bit or stereotyping a bit, but I've been in Memphis sessions that are pretty much the same as they were then. Which everybody shows up when they feel like it. They eat a bunch of Southern food. It's pretty hot. Everybody's really relaxed. They kind of just, somebody picks up an instrument, starts playing, everybody joins in. And then a beautiful masterpiece materializes in the air in front of you that will live forever. And then you eat more potato salad and hang out a little bit more and people drift in and out. And you can feel that in the music. You know, that, that doesn't happen that way in a New York studio where there are union rules and the musicians are, are union and everything has to be as efficient as possible and everybody's on the clock and so forth. You know, uh, while I'm on my unconventional theories of why, how recording changed, one of the, a couple other things that I think change the sound of and the feel of recording. Uh, one is obviously the drum booth and isolation of musicians and headphones. You know, it's really uh, interesting. Uh, one of the things I play on one of the first days in class for the students is uh, the session of Frank Sinatra recording, It Was a Very Good Year. And it's him in a big studio with a full orchestra and, incidentally, a bleacher full of celebrities staring at him while he's recording. And it's all being recorded and mixed live. That gives you a certain... Uh, probably more correct priority, which is the vocal ends up being the most important thing. The orchestra is following the vocal and playing to it. If anybody plays louder than Frank, they're fired. And the room, the function of the room is to blend the music. The room is a mixer. As you get into multi-track recording where we can isolate the elements of the performance, even if it's happening in real time, uh, and everybody has their own headphone mix, and the drummer just hears the drums and... You know, who everybody else hears more me, they hear themselves. Uh, you get to these situations, as we often have now, where you program it, you build it, you make the track, you fill it up, and then you do the vocals last. And I think it's inverted priority. Everything should follow the, the vocals for a sort of simple biological reason that as humans, we're most tuned into human communication in the form of speech. You know, our brains are oriented that way, our ears are oriented that way. Uh, add to that a metronome where the musicians are having to stay with the click. Um, and then another uh, theory that I have about this is uh, I think there was a, a big change when the guitar tuner came in. If you listen to Beatles outtakes before they're playing, they'll strum a few notes on the guitar. Those guitars are horribly out of tune. Uh, paperback writer. Those guitars are terribly out of tune. The D string is way flat on the signature riff. Um, we, we accept it because that's how it's always been and it sounds like it was a monument that was discovered, not something that was created. Anyone these days would say, oh, stop, 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 stop. Uh, Could you all tune your guitars and they would get them all to, you know, A440 correctly. There's a very different feel of music when it's all in tune with itself. And it's not always pleasant. You know, when things are wider tonally, it feels different. And it gets a little spikier and it gets a little wider in its tonality. And things can stand out more in a mix because our ear can separate them when they're in a different tuning. So I think all these things that make us maybe more comfortable and make us feel like we're doing it right, like a metronome or a click track, like the same thing, a metronome or, uh, you know, a guitar tune, may not necessarily be the best thing for the music. We should feel free to ignore them these days. Are there any big differences in terms of technology between the different cities? To a certain extent, there were, there were some differences in technology, and um, you know, especially in the earlier days when Columbia made their own consoles and RCA made their own consoles, and so on. Um, it really depends on the era we're talking about. 
you know, Bill Putnam from Universal Audio was a big influence on everyone. Uh, but especially on the West Coast, you had a lot of his consoles, Frank Dimidio's consoles and Bob Bushnell. So there was a certain, probably a certain sound that came from that. Also, Bill Putnam was a, a big influence on just the design and the shape of rooms and the way they would sound in chambers. But, you know, he would he would consult with all kinds of people in all kinds of towns. So there's... Um, so in the earlier days, there were some some variations. I think this may be a little unkind, but I think that a lot of the sound of some of the Southern stuff in Muscle Shoals and Memphis and New Orleans and Miami, I had to do with uh, less access to qualified technicians. I think a lot of the tape machines were out of calibration. And I think that explains a lot of what we love about the sound of the low end and the kind of thumpiness of it and the, uh, the over-modulated top end that makes it sound cool. Uh, so yes and no. You know, through the period of the 60s and 70s, once you got MCI and people could buy a, a package of a tape machine and a console and didn't have to build their own boards, it made a wider dissemination of technology and people were more likely to be able to afford to have a studio. Uh, but it did also make for more generification. Um, then again, uh, to contradict myself for the fourth time in this statement, uh, you know, the, the tape machine and the console are only part of the equation. You know, by far the biggest shaper of the sound is the players and their instruments, you know, and the room. And the microphones have a lot to, to do with that. So it's, there were regional variations, but it's also interesting and a challenge in writing this book that uh, not to just say not to just keep repeating the same thing because a lot of studios you know, they start out with some sort of a custom built tube thing with rotary knobs and then they went to an API or a Neve or a, something like it and then later there was a proliferation of, MC, of MCI machines in particular and, and Studers for those who could afford it. Um, you know, one of the other things that actually, of course, makes a huge difference in recording is the monitoring system and that's changed a lot. You know, the decisions you make change depending on what you're listening to. So in the early days, almost everybody was listening to all texts. Which of you have ever heard them, 604s in particular? If you've ever heard them, they're not great sounding speakers in my opinion. They're not very high fidelity. They're actually probably designed to point out problems in recording, especially critical problems, which is what I would contend to be the most important thing in recording anyway, is the level of the vocal and the intelligibility of the vocal. But, you know, later on uh, in the 70s, you started getting big systems, big custom-built systems, you know, Augsburgers and Uries and stuff like that. Um, and I think the goal, despite what everybody said, the goal basically was volume in those days. Um, and, you know, there have also been a sets of higher-fidelity speakers, too. And, you know, now we have a wide variety of choices. You mentioned different microphones. Were there any big kind of noticeable changes in terms of which areas had access to different microphones, maybe in terms of, as the 60s went on, having more condensers instead of ribbons and more dynamics and that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, to begin with, uh, a lot of the microphones were uh, were RCA ribbons because they were you know, widely available uh, from RCA, and you know, they were used in radio stations and TV stations and all of that. Uh, but even, you know, in the in the earlier times, people were aware of Neumann's new 47s, that kind of thing. So somebody like Rudy Van Gelder had them. Uh, there was a company called Gotham Audio in New York City that was the importer of EMT plates and Neumann and stuff. So there was, for those who could afford it, a proliferation of new 47s, later U67s, and, and so forth. Uh, and then a widespread use of dynamics, electro voice mics in particular in the, in the 60s. Um, and then later, of course, everybody got the U87s, which were solid-state versions, because they were so much more convenient and you know took less maintenance and that kind of thing. There's a famous story that Rick Hall of fame, Muscle Shoals, got upset that the engineers weren't using the nice new solid-state stuff that he bought them. So he took all the old tube gear, probably Pultex and 47s and 67s. We don't really know how much gear. Uh, after having drunk a little bit and uh, buried them on his land. 
with an end loader. Uh, this is the point in the store where I always volunteer to show up with a metal detector. It's somewhere on that large ranch. But uh, So there have been changes in, in the technology, not usually that violent. Can you think of any particular reasons why dynamic mics became less popular as it went into the kind of 70s and 80s? Because if you look at a lot of sessions in the 60s, they're using dynamic mics and everything, like acoustic guitars, drum overheads, pianos. But then now that's very uncommon. Is there anything that in particular you think that changed? Well, partly you did have higher fidelity recording as, as we got into the 70s, arguably. Uh, and people, I think, were going more for full range recording. I mean, one, one thing that affected that was the uh, proliferation of FM radio, which had a wider bandwidth than AM radio. You know, the, the destination for a lot of the popular music recording in the 60s and earlier was a transistor radio you know, or small radio, um, in which case you really didn't have to worry about extending the low end or having a very bright top end. So that, that was one influence, FM radio, and, you know, of course, stereo came in at 58. Um, so that's part of it, and I think some of it is just the uh, recordings, the aesthetic changed, and, and in general, I think things got more wide range, and, and people started to take popular music more seriously, you know, when you got Dylan and the Beatles uh, and others, that the people started to look at it as something worth spending money on and that it was more than just a teenage phenomenon for somebody who was going to play it on their little record player. So you, you did start to get a little bit more of an audiophile aesthetic to things where, you know, people would be sitting in a room with a giant pair of cost headphones listening to the record. Um, so, you know, fidelity became more of, of an issue. Also, I think um, there's just a certain amount of, there's always been a certain amount of fashion in recording engineers. And, and although in those days you couldn't look it up online, but you, you know, you could, we would pour over what photos we could find of people in studios on the back of records. And uh, So I think there's a certain extent that people would uh, do things because they had seen it done or they had heard it was done in a certain way. It's a good question. In terms of, sounds generally becoming more dead going into the 70s do you think it was a case of the fact that the rooms became smaller and the spaces became deader which then made the records more dead or was it that they were actually chasing dead sounds and then they made it that way taste wise it's it's hard to say you know uh, aesthetics are so recursive they always sort of come back on themselves so um partly i think it was shrinking room spaces, room sizes, because of real estate prices. Partly it was when you had multi-track recordings, you know, multi-track coming in, and if the producer or somebody from a record company says, hey, solo up that instrument, and they go, and they go well, but there's, I'm hearing all the other instruments in there. You know, Okay, then we should put some baffles in there, we should put them in a separate room. And if it's going to be a small room, you can't use the Small, you know, if it's a really small room, you can't use the acoustics of that space to your advantage. So then you deaden it up. So partly, I think it was a matter of a shifting sense of control, where if you had an orchestra and a band and a singer all in one room, you used the room as a mixer, and you tried to capture what was going on, and you could move them around, uh, but you had to get it all correct at the beginning. So partly, I think... With multi-track, the idea was just, you know, that you could maybe have a little uh, control over the level. But later it became, well, we can do the vocal later, or we can fix the vocal later, or we can fix each part later. And when you have that control, there's a tendency to want to exercise it, whether it's good for the music or not. Uh, also because there's a, a little bit of, of insecurity, not just of the artists themselves, but of the engineers, right? If we're going to be there, we have to justify our being able to be there. So... If we're going to be, have some control, we need to be able to actually exercise control. And if it gets to the point where people expect that they can punch in a vocal without everything changing or that they can change a drum part without changing everything else, we need to be able to provide that. So I think both the kind of insecurity of the clients wanting us to be able to fix anything and the feeling that we wanted to have more control, um, coupled with the development of artificial reverb. I mean, we'd have EMT plates in the 50s, and, and they had echo chambers a lot 
but you know when you started getting digital reverb it was again it's the same idea that well we we can record a neutral sound and then apply ambience to it later because we have these fantastic boxes uh, and so that makes for a dead recording and then I think kind of as a result of those changes and maybe a deliberate aesthetic change, you got these recordings where you had really dead, you know, dead drums or dead guitars. Um, and, you know, we got some fantastic results from some of those, those techniques. Uh, but we also got some disembodied results and we got some uh, situations where I think you could argue that the technology takes charge of the aesthetic process and that is not necessarily the best thing for music or musicians for them to be not just physically isolated but spiritually and physically you know isolated from each other where they can't see each other they can't see the other person's foot tapping they can't see them breathing you know a big part now we know now of making music is that it, people actually synchronize brain waves when they're playing music together if they're in the same room you know we have mirror neurons where we're able to feel what somebody else is feeling and, and uh, an orchestra forms a kind of a giant brain. And we're interfering with that process of synchronizing brains when we put people in different rooms. So I think that's you know, not always been a good idea. You can, we could certainly overdo it and get the, uh, get the aesthetics backwards. And we can let the insecurity drive us to the point where what we have now where somebody will record 12 microphones on a guitar amp figuring that they're just going to figure it out later. And then they're going to do a hundred takes figuring that one of them has to be good. And then they're going to do 250 vocal takes and so forth. And it ends up, um, proliferating the number of decisions that we can make as opposed to narrowing it down. You know, in the initial era, if you're recording live to mono, you are making all the decisions in real time as they're playing your mixing. And it's remarkable that we've gotten such great results from that in many cases. Um, and it's cool to have options, but we can have so many options that we just get paralyzed or that we keep getting farther and farther away from the goal rather than uh, boiling it down to what will eventually be the song. So that was a little bit more than you'd asked. But I think, uh, you know, I, I think it's all part of what we've had since the beginning of recording, which is the interplay between art and technology and commerce. And those things are always pushing each other in different directions. And... Uh, you know, the, the technology has changed the sound of music since the Edison gramophone. You mentioned reverb before. Do you think there are any things influenced with the different studios you would use plate reverbs or spring reverbs or actual echo chambers? Yeah, I, I do think the sound of, of many studios was defined by the sound of their echo or reverb. Um, and partly it was what they could afford or what they had available to them. You know, the nice thing about some of those New York studios, they had big stairways, staircases that they could put a speaker and microphones in. Um, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful aspect of recording in a live chamber. There are, you know, they just come out with the UAD version of the Capitol Chambers. Uh, but it's a, you know, there's something beautiful about the randomness of a real room and uh, the bigger qualities of a real room. So the sound of a real chamber is, is a real can be a real defining sound of the studio. Uh, plates also, but the thing about plates is that they have to be properly tuned, meaning you, you have to tension the plate in such a way that it, uh, you know, how you tension it gives you different sounds. Also, uh, the, te the temperature and humidity of where it is and how it's been cared for. And of course, springs were more affordable and had a particular sound to them. So I'm friends with a great engineer named Chris Huston, who has had an amazing history. Uh, but he recorded uh, the original version of It's a Man's World, James Brown. Reverb was beautiful on it, and it's a, it's a Fisher spring, which you would never guess. Uh, so, yeah, I do think that all those choices and then the combinations of them and everybody's techniques, you know, into, like would they delay the plate or the chamber and and what were they using and what mics and speakers did they have? All those things really contribute to the, to the sound of it. You know, it's another one of those primary senses that a human has um, that we may not even be aware of, that in, in our brain we're always analyzing the space that we're in. Um, it's 
part of cell preservation as our hearing is. And uh, so it's, it's actually an important, uh, it's an important factor in recordings, you know, the, the sensation of space, the perception of space. If it's all right with you, I'd like to go through some of your kind of personal favorite mics and techniques. I mean, of course, it varies through session to session, but in terms of just things that you go back to a lot and that sort of thing, maybe if we start with the drums, kind of standard rock session, what are some of your go-to favorite mics and techniques? These days, I often start with a Sennheiser 602 in the bass drum. I just love the what it does. Uh, and for an inside bass drum microphone, it gives the attack the way I'd like to hear it. If not, uh, a Beta 52, uh, or sometimes an RE20 or Sennheiser 441. I don't use outside bass drum microphones anymore. I have a fairly sort of signature technique that I try to brainwash all the students into using, which is I take an eight gallon water bottle, I put it right in front of the bass drum, and I hang a microphone about three inches off the bottom of it by its cable. I should emphasize empty water bottle. And it's a resonator. And then I low pass filter it about somewhere between 80 and 120 hertz. And it makes the bass drum uh, resonate a beautiful way in, in the low end. And it makes the acoustic bass drum sound like an 808. I am usually of the mindset to get most of the drum, the rest of the drum sound other than the bass drum. Uh, from the overheads, as opposed to the overheads being simple microphones. I use a wide variety of things for overheads. It goes anywhere from a single U47, a single Coles 4038, uh, a single RCA microphone could be a 77. We have wonderful mics at Blackbird, so sometimes a KU3. Uh, sometimes it's a, a mono ribbon, and then on either side of it, pointed down into the kit about 45 degrees, either a pair of U67s, because we can, and they're wonderful. Uh, what I've been using lately is something that I learned from George Massenberg, which is a beautiful microphone called a Sankin CU41. It's a dual diaphragm condenser microphone, solid state. It is just absolutely uh, beautifully smooth and, and lush. And it, it, the cymbals uh, don't sound harsh through it. It's also a wonderful acoustic guitar microphone, a wonderful vocal mic, and a wonderful piano microphone. It's getting very expensive to work at Blackbird because now I have to I have a bunch more microphones on my list of the hundreds of mics to add to the hundreds of mics that I already have. Anyhow, Sankin CU41, marvelous. Uh, I mic the hi-hat with a Sony ECM55, which is the lavalier, and I do it out of superstition. If I don't mic the hi-hat, then I know I'm going to need it, so I mic it so I can disable it and hide it. Uh, for snare drum, I used to do top and bottom and all that sort of thing. I generally use a 414, pointed at the side of the shell, slightly closer to the top head than the bottom head, pretty close in and sometimes super cardioid. And I just move it up and down to balance the top head versus the bottom head. The overheads catch the diaphragmatic motion of the head going up and down. Uh, so what I'm going for is the fatness that comes off of the shell to be able to add that in. Tom Toms, all sorts of stuff. Uh, when they're around, I love the Josephson E22 microphones that were built for Steve Albini originally. Wonderful microphones. I've been known to use 421s. I don't anymore because I think they sound great on Tom Toms and make cymbals sound horrid. Um, in my own studio, I often use really cheap MXL 2001s, large capsule condensers with a pad on them. I just like the way they sound. My basic goal is to mic everything so I don't have to EQ them. Um, and uh, then I have taken to doing something that I learned from a great engineer in Nashville named Bobby Holland, uh, which is we call front of kick. It's just an RCA, well, I usually use an AEA R84. It's a ribbon microphone, although I've been known to use Royers and RCAs for this purpose. It's a ribbon microphone over the resonant head of the bass drum. So the head that's farther from the drummer, about a couple of inches, pointed basically at the drummer's stomach. And that can capture the whole kit magnificently. 
sometimes I just fool people and I push out that one microphone and say, well, how do you like the drum sound? Oh, it's fine, perfect. Yeah, it's one microphone. The trick is, and again, this is expensive, and I don't remember the number of it, but I use the Tube Tech multiband limiter, where, which is, if you think about it, because it has, it splits things into low, mid, and high. And if you think about it, since it has gain for each of those three bands, it is basically an EQ as well as a multiband compressor. So I can set different attack and release times, the amount of compression for each. Where you cross it over is critical. And then I typically, you know, turn the mid-range down a bit and boost the low end. And that is wonderful. I like to use room mics. I don't always end up using them. Um, what I usually use in a room is an Electro Voice 635A, what we call a hammer mic. It's an omni-dynamic. Uh, it's less bright. I don't usually want as much symbols in, in, in there. I've started, I've taken to um, doing room mics now also that are, instead of being out in the room, they're mounted at, they're at the kit and they're pointing at the walls so that you get the round trip reflection off the walls. That could be fun. And then if there's a chamber, I like to put a mic in there. Again, typically a dynamic, and I also tend to go mono. A lot of people like to mic chambers in stereo. Usually, there's, I don't think there's enough stereophonic information in there to put two mics in. Um, so I usually mic the chamber, but I don't always end up using it. It just depends. You know, if it's a ballad, it can be nice. Then a mic that I almost always end up using is what we call a Vance mic. It's a Vance Powell mic. I first saw him use it. They used to be really cheap until people figured out that Vance was using them. Uh, it's called an Ampex 1101. It looks like a little sort of a bent salt shaker. It's a, but pretty much any crappy dynamic unbalanced microphone will do. I put it into a rat pedal, guitar pedal, which is a pretty terrible on guitar and great on everything else. And the nicest thing about it is, you know, you can control how much distortion there is, but the nice thing is it has a filter. It's a low pass filter, so you can bring some of the high end in. You get it tuned. I spend usually more time tuning the rap pedal than getting the rest of the drum sound, which shouldn't take me more than 20 minutes at the most. Um, and that adds a lot of limiting and a lot of room because it's so crushed and a lot of mid range information. And it brings up, and I, and I randomly throw that microphone on the floor somewhere under the bass drum or near the bass drum or under the floor tom. Uh, and that's the thing that kind of brings a lot of nice flavor into things. It can also make a really nice uh, breakdown. You know, if you get to some place where you just want a lo-fi drum kit by itself, that and the water bottle can be really nice. And then I usually try other things. I'll put mics and bottles and boxes and cases. I'll hang a pair of headphones over it, run them into a direct box. Sometimes I have an SM57 over the drummer's shoulder pointed at the snare drum, which can be nice and bright. And uh, I'll try other things. It's often put room mics on the floor to kind of make my own PZM. But that's my usual setup. With that snare mic on the side of the snare, are you getting any of the underneath kind of rattle of the snares in it? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, it's, so by adjusting it vertically, you can, you know, decide how much of that, that rattle and buzz you want off the bottom head. How close do you normally have it to the side? Pretty close, two, three inches with a 20 BB pad on it. I'm um, just trying to keep the hi-hat out and the other instruments. But really, it's, it's a supplementary thing. Hopefully, we're getting most of the sound from the overheads. Uh, but since the bass drum is going away from the overheads in the proper polarity, the bass drum microphone is useful. And then the, the others are really for supplementation. If you're trying to get a lot of the snare sound from the overhead, where do you normally place it, if it's just mono? There, um, if, whether it's mono or stereo, I usually have them in kind of as close together as possible. Sometimes I use a Shure VP88, which is middle side mic. Um, and kind of inconveniently, it's usually essentially right in front of the drummer's head and slightly over. And if you look at the 60s pictures, they often had a microphone that was basically right in front of their forehead. Uh, they were fairly low. The main thing is if they have their cymbals high, you don't want it to be in a case where it might hear the cymbals inverting if they're swinging. So it needs to be either above or below the cymbals, typically slightly above. Uh, but 
when you're trying to get most of the drum sound from the, the overheads, the placement is really critical. So, you know, you can move them forward to get more of the toms. You can move them up to get more of the room. You can balance the snare by pointing them a little bit more uh, straight up and down. So the, there is a certain amount of running in and out and, and uh, moving the mics by degrees to get it correct. Do you ever have problems with drummers hitting a mic there, especially if it's a Coles or something? Uh, yeah. I try to tell them not to. And, and you know, I, I'll watch them drum and I might choose a, a less expensive microphone if they're wild. I've also taken to another uh, conflicting overhead approach, which is really um, is hard to justify in terms of phasing and that kind of thing, but it seems to work fine. Where I take those Sankins, the CU41, and I basically do a zone micing. One is over the, the drummer's left part of the kit, so it's snare drum, hi-hat, crash cymbal, and rack tongue. And I balance between them. And then at a, roughly the same height on the other side, there's one that's floor tom, ride cymbal, and whatever else is over there. Again, you know, that, that seems like it's a phasing problem, but it sounds good. Yeah, I think I've seen pictures from the Wrecking Crew recording where they have quite a similar thing with two Sony mics. One's right over the snare and one's going to right over the floor tom. Um, mm-hmm. Always wondered how it would sound. Yeah, and then, you know, there's obviously the famous Glenn Johns technique who Glenn says that, you know, that he never really did it that way and he wasn't carefully measuring all that sort of thing. But, you know, that, that kind of zone micing can work. You get into interesting questions if you're doing, say, a Glenn John style of how do you pan the microphones to keep the snare in, in the center. Uh, for example, another mic that I really love to use for overhead, especially for jazz, is an AEA R88 stereo bloom line mic, which I call the bug zapper. And one of the things that I'll do with that is... Uh, angle it from the drummer's left to, towards their right. So it kind of uh, bisects the kit. And and both the uh, both the kick and snare end up in the center uh, in the center if you if you put them equally. Um so maybe moving on to electric guitar, your favorite mics techniques? That's an easy one. I've used just about everything you can possibly think of. I almost always use one Bayer M88. And I put it a few inches off the grill cloth, sometimes further back, depends on the sound. Uh, but usually it's a few inches off the grill cloth or essentially touching the grill cloth, and it is right where the dome meets the cone. It just sounds as much to me like the sound of the amp as possible. Uh, I don't have to blend a couple of microphones. It's become very fashionable to have a 57 and a 121 you know, or uh, a 421 and a Royer 121. But uh, that's what I like to do, and, and I've been doing it that way for a long time. Do you normally process that at all in terms of EQ? Nope. My, my general goal is to not use equalizers. So that, uh, I go for things that sound the way I like them to sound without manipulation. Uh, I will, you know, if it's in a decent room and it's the kind of sound that can standard i'll typically have a room mic also you know 67 or something like that um partly for communication with the guitar player if they're in there with the amp and partly just to have a little bit of ambience that i can pan or not why do you think electric guitar miking has changed so much over time because if you look at a lot of pictures from the 60s the techniques compared to now are totally different well the goal is different the volume is different the gear is different, the aesthetics are different. Um, and, and also the level of control. Again, there's that blending versus isolating thing. So it's, it's a little bit of everything. I think people can get in trouble with proximity effect, especially with ribbons. Um, I, I just feel as though if you're using a technique that requires you to do a lot of carving, then you should probably improve the technique. <laughs> But of course, as I said, you know, it's it's really what you want to hear. So it's you know the question is what are you what are you looking to uh, to get? And it's just uh, I, I love that. I will occasionally mic the strings of the electric guitar, even if it's a solid body guitar. Blend that in. That can be that can be a pleasing texture. What about acoustic guitar? Pretty variable um, because. 
again, we're at Blackbird, and I have some my own mics. I mean, uh, there's nothing like a, a small capsule Neumann suit mic. I love a Cam 54 nickel capsule microphone. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, and now I'm not going to remember the number, but there's a mic tech. It's called a C5, I think, which is a, a little Cam 84 like microphone. That's a lovely acoustic guitar microphone. Um, there are, uh, I, I love an SM2, which is basically a stereo 256 Neumann. I, I do like stereo microphones on acoustic guitars, but I don't like wide placement of two mono microphones. I think it does become a phasing problem because all guitar players move around while they're playing. So I, I like a single point, you know, bloom line or XY microphone. So an SM2 is beautiful, an SM69 is beautiful. Uh, the mic that I most often use on acoustic guitar is a little surprising. It's that Shure VP88 that I mentioned. It's a middle side modern stereo microphone. And uh, it just really works for me. I love the sound of it. But I do like to experiment. It's, uh, you alluded to this earlier, but you know what? Nothing wrong with an SM57 on acoustic guitar. It's surprising. Uh, I can see all my hi-fi friends frowning in, in my mind. But, you know, um, there are really so many different approaches to that. And, of course, to where you put it. And it... It's because the acoustic guitar can full, fill so many roles. You know, if we're doing a solo acoustic guitar recording, that's completely different from an overdub. And if it's an overdub, it really depends what we're trying to fit it into and how. Uh, and there are so many other variables that I'll go to besides the microphone, like the pick and the strings in the guitar and the placement of the guitar and player and so forth. Have you tried the 441 on acoustic? I think so. It's, I love that thing especially on electric bass guitar. Uh, but yeah, Sennheiser 441, that's a beautiful underused micro. It's, it's a beautiful uh, vocal mic where people like to use SM7s. It's, it's similar in that way that it's, uh, it has a very smooth and uh, upper mid-range and high end. I do love the sound of those things. And they have more output than an SM7. I'm trying to turn everyone onto them onto acoustic guitars because they're one of my favorite acoustic mics never see anyone using them yeah yeah it's a beautiful thing do you have any techniques for recording someone singing at the same time as playing acoustic yes sometimes i'll take a single bloom line microphone or create a bloom line pair so i'll have a figure eight mic that's pointing at at the guitar with the dead with the null pointing at their mouth and vice versa another one pointing at their mouth uh, and that can work nicely. Other times, it's just I'll have something like the VP88, but it's pointed a little more downward at the, at the guitar. And then I'll have something, you know, some good microphone, 47 or 67 or 49, an SM7, whatever, um, pretty much under their chin pointing up. But it's always been tricky, and of course a big part of it is, is how they balance themselves. How, how loud do they play? How loud do they sing? And also the room that they're in. You mentioned you liked the 441 on bass. Do you have any other favorite bass microphones? Well, it's funny. Um, for electric electric bass guitar. Yeah. Yeah. I do. Uh, I, can, I think I go for the 441 first. I do like an RE20. A good RE20 is lovely. Uh, a FET 47 can be wonderful. And of course, you know, uh, ooh, Again, at Blackbird, we're spoiled with all the microphones, but you know that we have the option of putting 251s and U47s and, and that kind of thing on. Um, that can be really great. I don't always use a bass amp. Uh, it's funny, uh, at Blackbird and in my, in my studio too, the bass amp of choice usually is an Ampeg B15 flip top. And I look at that as kind of a fuzz box, typically. It's sort of supplementary to the DI sound. Then again, there are players who uh, refuse to use a DI and don't like the sound. So it's all very context-driven. Do you do most of your own recording with everyone in the same room, all the amps in the same room and everything? Or do you use some isolation? It, it's highly variable. Uh, I love to have everybody in the same room. Most typically, I try to get everybody in the same room as much as possible, often with the exception of the drummer. And we isolate the amps. 
So that's that's how it usually ends up being sort of uh, practically. But there are times where it's you know, it, it, you know, it varies. Sometimes we're overdubbing people, or we have the keyboards in a separate room, and uh, you know, sometimes it's everybody in the room with a PA system. So it's, it depends on what we're doing and how bravely the band is is willing to commit to uh, things that we might not be able to uh, quote unquote fix after the fact. My argument being, well, if we get it feeling good in the first place, then we won't have to go in and do a bunch of fixing and moving things around. And it's it's one of those central questions about recording is uh, who's making the record? I think there's this, this perception that the engineer is going to make the record for you. And I think for any engineer to say to an, a musician, oh, I'll fix that for you, is an insult. Uh, I try not to use that language, you know, the, uh, because at some point they get the idea that, okay, I'm just sort of providing raw material, but you're going to make the record, you're going to tune things and time things and replace them and, and so forth. And so then it's, it's kind of out of my hands. And, um, you know, we have the capability of doing that, but we, we need to be aware, as with any technology, of the moral and ethical implications of it. Do you have any techniques for working with bleed that you've discovered over the years? Yeah, you know, it's a funny thing working with bleed. Uh, when I record jazz, I try to have everybody in the same room as much as possible. And a lot of people would think, well, in that case, we need to get them as far apart as we can, so we'll have less bleed. Uh, but I do the opposite, which is to put them as close together as possible. You know, the drums are in the bend of the piano. Everybody's right on top of each other. And if we're lucky, we're not wearing headphones. And then the... It's not up to us to tell them how loud to play. They, they're, they'll interact. If somebody's drowning somebody else out, everyone will know. And everybody will quiet down when it's time for somebody's solos, if they're in the least bit sensitive musicians. Uh, and, you know, yes, we ha- so we have a lot of bleed, but we, depending on mic techniques, have enough leeway to turn something up or down or, or help it. But that way the musicians do the mixing and we're just capturing and maybe if, if that, you know, the best enhancing or something like that. So that's, that's one technique. Uh, my friend Jeff Powell, who's a great engineer from Memphis, uh, worked with Glenn Johns, and they use something they call the Barnstall technique, where if you've got a rock and roll band, you want them in the same room so you can have it feel like a rock and roll band. You put the drum set in the room, and you put the amplifiers right next to the drum set with baffles between them, with the front baffles of the cabinets lined up with the front of the bass drum. And you can, I mean, if they're insanely loud, it doesn't work, but if, if everybody's relatively balanced, it's remarkable how much isolation you get. I'm not even sure what the physics are, what's going on, but it does seem to work. So that's a, that seems to be a valid technique as well. Um, you know, it's to, if you think about all those great records that Sam Phillips made at Sun, and all the great records that were made in the 60s, they were not without bleed, but you can, uh, you can sculpt it by where you put people and what mics you choose and where you place them uh, to get good sound of bleed that enhances the recording. In particular, ribbon mics seem to work really well for that because the, dull, the, uh, the null, the dead side of a ribbon mic is, so, uh, is the deadest side of any microphone we have. So you can use that to get a fair amount of isolation. And depending on the size and the shape and the acoustics of the room, it can really be an enhancement rather than uh, something to be overcome. Just moving on to piano, do you have any favorite mics for upright or grand? For grand piano, uh, my favorite is a pair of M49s, one over the bass and mid-range strings where they cross, and high enough that we're hearing a fairly wide area of the piano. And then the, the one over the treble side, also being elevated enough that it's not just pointing into a few strings, but that it's here in the overall area. And then I take a KM84 with a pad on it. I usually go to the second or third hole from the player, and I put it on a very sturdy stand about an eighth of an inch off the soundboard. It's just, it was just really almost touching the soundboard. And then I compress the crap out of it with something like an 1176. Uh, because I like the big, lush, wide, spacious sound of two, two condenser mics on a beautiful brand. But it can be a little bit billowy and uncentered. And that hard, mid-range, centered sound that it, the 84 gives can uh, just pan 
right in the middle, can really uh, focus it, and pull it together. Uprights, it depends. Depends how much we're going for the, uh, you know, for the hammers, and how much we're going for the strings. Uh, I, I often mic them from behind the piano if I can get at it. Sometimes I have a mic pretty much over each, each shoulder of the player. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, over their head, kind of pointing in. It depends. You know, sometimes for um, upright piano, we're going more low fidelity. I think the last thing we haven't covered is vocals. You got any favorite vocal mics? I do, and I'll mention my uh, computer just told me that it's getting low on battery, so hopefully it'll last this long. Um, vocal microphones. Very particular to the singer. Uh, as usual, I try not to have any set mic that I'll use. Um, I guess, having said that, if there's a U67 around, that's never a bad starting point. SM7 seem to be great for uh, people who get harsh or hip hop, uh, you know, rappers and that kind of thing. Um, but it, it's really a matter of choosing a mic that complements the singer and the surroundings. So I, I do love a good U47. And I would have to say that warm U47 is quite good. Uh, an M49 can be beautiful. You know, and then all, all this is what John McBride calls the good guy microphone, sort of the big beast, you know, the C12s and 251s and that sort of thing. Um, but it's, uh, it's very particular. You know, I just did a record for Warner Brothers, and we used an Electro Voice RE10 uh, on a lot of the vocals, which is a cheapo dynamic microphone. It just... I just kind of loved the way it sounded, and that's the way we went, and no one's ever going to complain about it, I hope. So, uh, you know, the, the vocal is so important to a record, and the vocal sound is so important to how we portray the character that the singer becomes, uh, that the way that we portray them, you might say the way that we light them with the microphone, the way that we illuminate different parts of their voice, uh, is, is highly critical. Um, I'm also in the habit of uh, recording two microphones off note, you know, some sort of big hi-fi U47 or something like that. And then something like a bullet, microphone assure bullet or that Vance mic through some guitar pedals or a little guitar amp or something. Something that emphasizes all the, the upper mids that has some distortion to it um, that adds or w adds a whispery quality. Something that basically gives us more intelligibility. It gives us the sort of things that we would normally EQ or compress to get. Uh, but we just have a nice separate fader we can blend it in or flip it between them. I think that's all my questions. Thank you so much for speaking with me. Thanks, Hamish. I hope it was interesting. It was great talking.